Well, good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing all right? We're glad that you're here. So if you didn't catch uh, last week, we kind of intro this series called Women of Faith, just five weeks looking at five women from the Old Testament. We set up kind of like faith heroes. And um, if you didn't watch last week, I want to encourage you, there's some intro material that you don't want to miss um, that kind of sets the tone for where we're going to be uh, this next little while together. So we're talking about five women, just kind of stories of their lives, women in the Old Testament and um, kind of faith heroes. And uh, so I thought it would be appropriate to show you three of my, actually, faith heroes, <laughs> these guys. And uh, somebody told me this morning uh, that this movie turns 85 years old today. If you don't know what this movie is, by the way, I don't know where you've been living. Uh, Wizard of Oz, a little word about each one of these faith heroes. First off, the Scarecrow. I like this guy because he always runs into this thing where he goes, if I only had a brain, I feel you, I feel you. If I only had a brain. And then the tin man who looks absolutely terrified. What's he want? Not a heart, a heart. A heart, remember? A heart. He's like, I didn't know Oz was in like South Boston, but apparently he wants a heart. And then kind of our, our favorite, right? Everybody loves the cowardly lion. What's he want? Courage. De noive. He wants de noive. He wants courage. The cowardly lion's kind of all of our favorites. I love this guy. And Courage courage. All three of them together, like they make quite a pair or quite a trio, don't they? Courage. Courage. Churches are full of Christians who know what God's word has to say. We've got a brain. Churches are full of Christians who love what God's word has to say. We've got a heart. But living what God's word has to say. It's where we sometimes lose it. This is the heart behind James's word in the New Testament where he says, right, he says, don't deceive yourselves. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be what? Doers of the word. Yeah, that's where we kind of miss it. The Christian life takes courage. Courage to do the right thing when it's easier to do nothing. Courage to overlook an offense when I would rather obsess over the offense. Courage to forgive when I would rather hold on. Courage to keep going when every step seems harder. Courage to believe the best in others, to give them the benefit of the doubt when it's easier to doubt their benefit. <laughs> Courage to have a conversation. Courage to not. Courage to love when we don't feel like it. Courage to pray when no words come. Courage to not give in to the worst case scenario. Courage to reach out rather than to recoil. Courage to step up rather than shrink back. Courage to speak up rather than shut up. To follow what God's saying rather than what I'm feeling. Courage. A courageous man or woman is someone who I believe is fully awake in the moment and fully obedient to God. So what's it take? Courage. That's where we're going today. This feels weird um, for me, honestly, to, to talk about courage because if there's one place in my life that I, I wish I could work on, I would like to be more bold in my belief. Uh, maybe that doesn't surprise you, or maybe it does surprise you. Maybe it doesn't. You're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> I don't want to be like, I don't mean bold like angry. I don't mean bold like aggressive. I don't mean bold like obnoxious. But what I want really in my life is I know there is a big gap a lot of times between what I know and love about God and actually how I live for God. Anybody with me in that one? You don't have to raise your hands, I know. So if you want to close that gap, today is going to be for you. We're talking about Rahab this morning. Week two of this five-week series called Women of Faith, Magnifying God's Work and Worth in the Lives of Five Old Testament Women. So this morning, we're looking at Rahab. Her story is found in Joshua chapter two. You can turn there, flip there, scroll there, or it'll be on the screens behind me. Um, out of all the women in the series, by the way, my opinion is that Rahab is the most unlikely candidate. She's the one nobody saw coming, and that's why her story is so beautiful to me. So before we get to Rahab, let's get our bearings a little bit. Uh, last week, we left off with a, with a promise, right? God told Abram and Sarah that they'd have a son, and they do. His name's Isaac, and it means laughter. And then Isaac grows up. He marries a woman named Rebecca, who's also barren, which is a thing. Yes, it is. 
Then Isaac and Rebekah have a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Whoa there, big fella. <laughs> then things get a little bit dark. God's people are enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years. And then God raises up a deliverer. That deliverer's name is Moses. And this is the high point of Israel's history. God leads them through the Red Sea on the dry land. Moses eventually dies. The people mourn for 30 days. And then it's time to go. Time to go where? God's about to make good on a decades-long promise for his people. Joshua chapter 1, just kind of to look at this real quickly. After the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Just as I promised Moses. This is great news, right? Like the mortgage papers are signed. The furniture is ordered. Like U-Haul is in the driveway. Not quite yet. There's one thing in their way. A fortress city called Jericho. God's people are scared spitless. And with good reason. Remember who they are at this point. God's people are a nation of migrants, wanderers, and pilgrims. They've been wandering the desert for 40 years, so they're not weaponized at this point. They're basically leaderless until now. They're tired, rootless, and intimidated. They have no distinct advantage, no upper hand, no contingency plan if things go south. This is the equivalent of peewee football, first-time head coach, no playbook. And they're going up against Jericho. Here's what you gotta know about Jericho. Jericho was home to 3,000 people, and it was built for power. It's the first thing. It had two walls. Its outer wall was six feet thick. Its inner wall was 12 feet thick. If Jericho was a football player, it'd be Bobby Boucher, middle linebacker. It was built for power, but it's also built for pleasure. Jericho, the name, actually literally means fragrant or smells good, and it's nestled right in a grove of palm trees. The city was a beautiful city. It was built for pleasure. And so if it helps you, think about Jericho like an ancient version of Las Vegas. What happens in Jericho? There you go. You're tracking with me. So with all of that as a backdrop, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, and especially Jericho. It's the only thing he tells them what to do. And they went, and they came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. Don't skip over that. <laughs> And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. I'm just going to stop right there. The text gets right to the point. Rahab, although she's kind of our main character, has a giant fly in the ointment of her biographical setup. What is it? She's a prostitute. <laughs> that's the first thing we know about her. And I'm sorry if that's like super direct. That's like the very, but that, the text says it before we even get her name, we get what she does. Did you look at that? Look at it again. They lodged with a prostitute whose name was Rahab. Rahab's profession and her position near the entrance of the city suggest that she actually might be a temple prostitute. Now, here's how this works. We're going to go a little bit further. Sorry. People in Jericho worshipped an ancient pagan deity named Ashereth, who was a cult goddess, the goddess of the moon. And if you were a visitor to Jericho and you wanted Ashereth's favor, what you would do is you would go to the temple and you would solicit the, of one of her workers. All that to say, Rahab's profession and her position make her a wealth of information. She knows more about the comings and goings of people in her city than anybody else. She hears men talk. Men talk about the outside world beyond the walls of the city. Battles won and lost. Think about the scene that night when these two spies kind of make their way in. It kind of paints itself, doesn't it? Evening firelight flickers on the stone walls, creating figures, casting shadows. The shuffle of workers coming home, conversations, jokes, evening 
aspirations. The smell of harvested flax drying on the rooftops gives the city a dark, earthy fragrance. And then in the gathering night, two men who are covered except for their faces, strange accents, strange clothes, their eyes never quite making eye contact with the keeper at the gate, silently slip into the stream. Where to go? The woman who lives in the wall. We'll talk to her. She'll know. She'll know what to do. They don't quite catch the casual whisper of one of the guards to the other guard, those two men. Spies? Yeah. Where are they going? Oh, they're going to her house. Go tell the king. The latch on Rahab's door falls and the stage is set. Moments later, Rahab's door So she motions to the spies, quick, up under the flax, on the roof, quick, there's flax, there's stalks up there, they're drying, hide. Verse three. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring out the men who've come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, true, the men came to me, but I don't know where they were from. Okay, kind of half true. When the gate was about to be closed dark, the men went out. Okay, nope. (laughs) That's a lie. Interesting. I don't know where the men went. Okay. Pursue them quickly for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof. She hid them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to Jordan as far as the fords. And the gate was shut as soon as her pursuers or the pursuers had gone out. Now it's important to understand what's happening here. Rahab's basically committing treason. And we don't really know her motive yet. That'll become clear. She has a clear command from her king who owns her business and probably owns her. She's got Two guards in her house with the object of their search tucked under sheaves of flax about 10 feet above their heads. And we can't say what her motive is yet. She's made a very courageous decision about who to trust. Kind of makes you wonder why. She's put her life in the hands of a God that she barely knows. Even though Jericho is obviously a morally questionable place, they still had law. The ancient law code in Jericho, as most of the ancient Near East, was called the Code of Humurabi, and it's got a section in it that says this, just listen, if felons are banded together in a prostitute's house and she doesn't hand them over to the king, she should be put to death. This was the law that Jericho lived with. This would have been common knowledge for Rahab, just like 25 miles an hour is on Schneider. I hate it when I have to drive through there. Nobody can go 25 miles an hour. Like, are you kidding me? (laughs) She would have known that to disobey this is breaking the law. She's a vulnerable woman with no rights, no hope, and no way out, or so it would seem. The situation actually isn't much more optimistic for God's people. Let's consider where they are, right? That little detail at the end of verse 7 that says, and the gates closed. Like you can kind of hear the clink, can't you? It's no accident. The writer gives us that little detail to give us a sense of the profound predicament that these guys are in. Let's put this into perspective. God's people, after wandering in the desert for 40 years, waiting for a land and a place to call home and people... They have put their entire future, staked the entire everything on two men who are staying in a prostitute's house, have already failed at their attempt at discretion, and are now trapped inside of the city that they're supposed to invade. Now, I am no military strategist, but this doesn't look very good. The scene shifts. From their hiding place under the sheaves of flax, the spies hear the latch of the door close again, and Rahab heads up the ladder to the roof. Footsteps, they lie still. The sheaves rustle. Who is it? Oh my gosh, they're going to pull us away. We're as good as dead. They pull it away. It's her. Verse 8. Before the men lay down, indication they were probably planning to stay the night up there because they had no other idea what to do, she came to them on the roof, and she said to them, now get this, I know that the Lord has given you the land 
and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. Hang on to that word melt for a little bit. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came to Egypt and what you did to the two kings, the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, who you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard about it, our hearts melted and there's no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will do kindly with my father's house and will give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. That's a pretty big ask. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives you the land, we, or gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. No stranger to negotiation. Rahab just lays it all out there. She goes, I know what's gonna happen. Jericho's going down. This is clear. And it seems to me that your God, although I barely know him, is a little bit stronger than our king is. Tell me he'll protect me. It's a pretty courageous move. Focus again, though, on what Rahab actually says. Look in verse 9. I know that the Lord has given you the land. That fear of you has fallen upon us. The inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We've heard. Verse 10. We've heard all about what happened. How Pharaoh's army drowned in there. We know. We know. We heard it. We know. That your God's basically unstoppable. Then verse 11, and as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there's no spirit left in us because of you. And then here is the biggie. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She pulls this imagery from Exodus, Moses' story. Your God splits seas. I know that. Now, we're not told how Rahab learned of any of that. It could have been news from soldiers. It could have been pillow talk. It could have been casual conversations, whispered rumors. But however she learned it, all we know is that fear of God's power leads to faith in God's plan. And you can check the grammar. What I love about that is it's all past tense. Did you catch that? We know God has given you the land. Not will, has. Like it's a done deal. God's already done this. He's already given you the land. It's as good as done. And therein lies the greatest insight about Rahab's courageous faith. That courageous faith is seeing something promised as something done because of the reliability of the one making the promise. It's already done. And even though the events that she's describing happened 40 years earlier, probably before she was even born, she mentions her father and her mother, brothers and sisters, no kids, which considering her profession is a little strange, but that gives us a clue that Rahab is probably pretty young still. So even though she wasn't alive when God split the sea for Moses and God's people, God's work never goes unnoticed. But the interesting thing to me is tied up around that word melt. Our hearts melt. What a vivid image that is. You ever had your heart melt? That's what anti-courage feels like. This is the cowardly lion jumping through the window when he sees the wizard going, oh my gosh. <laughs> Our hearts melted. But it isn't just interesting that her heart melts. It's why. In verse 11, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And there it is. That's the pinnacle of her confession, the climax of this little scene. You remember last week when I said, when you're studying the Old Testament narratives, quick little Bible study tip, usually the point of a story is buried in a line of dialogue. We said that with Sarah last week, where it was in verse 14 of Genesis, where she says, is anything too hard for God? That's the point of Sarah's story. This is the point of Rahab's story. The Lord, he is God, in heavens above and on the earth beneath. This is the line. This is the point of the whole thing. Rahab's courageous choice to act on the spy's benefit is based on a few scraps of story from a God she barely knows. 
and secures the future of a people she doesn't belong to, lighting the path to a future that she can't even imagine. This mustard seed faith, like Jesus would describe it. This is all she's got. But as it turns out, it's all that she needs. It's interesting, that word in verse 12, where she says, give me a sure sign. Give me a sure sign. That word shows up. Let's not breeze over that quickly. It's the same word in Noah, Noah's story, where God says, this rainbow in the sky is gonna be a sign for you. It's when God makes his covenant with Abraham and he says, this will be a sign for you. And probably most of all, in Passover, in Moses' story, the blood on the doorpost will be a sign. What does she mean? Why sign? It's the Old Testament concept of covenant. Let me covenant with you. Let me be a part of you. Get me in on this whole thing. I know something is coming. Please don't leave me out. And the spy's response is just awesome. Our life for yours, absolutely. So what happens? Verse 15. Then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was built into the city wall so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, Go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterwards, you may go on your way. What an interesting little military strategist she is. It's great. Then the men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. You shall gather into your house with your father and your mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, will be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on his own head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we'll be guiltless with respect to the oath you made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. She sent them away and so they departed. And she tied a scarlet cord in the window. There's a lot of imagery here that I want us to pay attention to. This window is probably 30 feet above the ground. It's the height of like this curtain behind me, the top of that. Rahab whispers further instructions down to the spies to ensure their protection. Before they head out in the hills, she tosses a scarlet cord. Why, you know, they had that, I don't know. This would become a symbol of redemption for Rahab's family. And I don't want to press this so far, but think about the color red and how it shows up, especially in the Old Testament. Red is almost always linked with redemption. All the time. In the Passover, remember? Doorposts covered in blood from a what? A spotless lamb. Scarlet was used in the tabernacle curtains when God would meet with his people. It was used in the priest's clothes in worship. Can you think of any other time where the color red is used to symbolize God's redeeming his people? You think God's foreshadowing something here? And you think that's cool. Look how this whole thing wraps up. Verse 22. They departed, they went out into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned. Then the pursuers searched along the way and they found zilch. The two men returned. They came down from the hills, passed over, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and they told him everything that had happened. Because by now, Joshua's sitting there going, where are these guys? So they come back, and they tell Joshua, verse 24, truly, the Lord has given us all the land into our hands, and also, all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. The key to understanding this section is wrapped around that word, melt. So if you're paying attention, that word sounds familiar. Two spies basically parrot back to Joshua the exact words that Rahab told them. Their hearts melt. So it's the second time this shows up in the narrative. But here's what I haven't told you. Here's the part that I left out until now. That part about hearts melting. Rahab wasn't the first person to say that. Those aren't really her words. I mean, she says them, and she means them. But those words actually came from a poem that Moses wrote 40 years earlier. A poem that Rahab had never read. I want to read it to you. It's in Exodus 15. It goes like this. Thinking about what God would do 
to prepare his people to enter into the promised land. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as stone until the people pass by. What's his point? Follow me on this. God moved Moses to write this. This idea that I'm gonna give it to you. I'm gonna make good on my promise. If I said it, I'm gonna do it. This is the story of God all throughout the Old Testament. Put this together. God inspires Moses to write a poem about a future conquest that Moses would never see. He puts the same words in the mouth of a prostitute, someone you would never expect, who will lead God's people into a future they could never imagine. Like, do you think God's sovereign? (laughs) Which leads us to where we need to go. What are we supposed to learn about God from Rahab? What does she have to do with me? We said last week that Sarah actually serves as a signpost for what saving faith looks like. When you come to the Old Testament narratives, here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to read this and go, okay, how can I be more like Rahab? Or how can I be more like Sarah? Or how can I be more like David? That's not how we're supposed to do the Old Testament. The way we approach the Old Testament is, what does this show me about God? (laughs) Where do I see God in here? How is he trying to reveal himself to me? That's the question. The point of God's word is not just to inform us about God, but to involve us in God's work. And so with that in mind, four conclusions from Rahab. Here's the first one. God uses messy people. (laughs) I was talking with somebody last week, and we were going over just this specific series, these five women in the Old Testament. And then we talked about characters in the New Testament. And they made this comment to me. They said, gosh, it really is hard to see anybody in Scripture who has a squeaky clean reputation. Have you ever noticed that? Like, everyone's got like a little fly in the ointment. Everybody's got a little bit of a mess about them. Sarah was so faithless. And now we look at Rahab and we're like, good gravy. How's God going to use this person? That seems to be the story, though, isn't it? That God uses messy people. All the time, Sarah, faithless, Abraham, equally so. Jacob, Jacob is a conniving opportunist. David, oh my. (laughs) Murderer, adulterer, liar. Moving into the New Testament, things aren't much better. Mary Magdalene, demon-possessed hooker. Paul, Christian killer. Peter, don't even get me started. (laughs) Why does God use people who are a complete mess? Funny thing is, it's not until you realize you're a complete mess that God uses you. This seems to be the biblical paradigm. We come to God thinking that we're something really great. God shows us that we're a mess. (laughs) We sit with that for a while. We eventually agree with God that we're a complete mess, and then he uses us for something great. That's how this goes. The task of Bible study or sitting under preaching isn't just that we read God's word, but we allow God's word to read us. And so thinking about Rahab, you look at it and you go, gosh, she is what's wrong with the world. You wouldn't let Rahab into your house if you knew what she did. The funny thing is that she's the exact kind of person that all of us are. I've got a past and so do you. And there are places in that past that are marked by decisions that you wish that you could erase, right? And the pain of those decisions are real and they are deep and they can be paralyzing. And so you're faced with a choice, aren't you? You either minimize it and shrink it and try and manage it so nobody knows about it. (laughs) The only difference between Rahab and you and me is that Her sin is public. It's written down here for all of us to read while most of us spend most of our lives trying to just kind of manage our darkness. Leads to point number two. God's plan for your future is not limited to your past. God's plan for your future is not limited to your past. One of the biggest lies that the enemy could plant in your head is that what you have done limits what God can do. 
And that's such a common lie. It's so easy to hear and it's so easy to believe. Here's why it's so dangerous. Trying to, or tying what God can do in your life to what you've done in the past of your life is reducing God to a mistake manager rather than a life changer. God doesn't want to just manage your mistakes and clean you up on the outside. He actually wants to change your life from the inside. I don't know if you know this. There are two ways to change your life. Outside in or inside out. Do you know which way is easier? Outside in. I will change my behavior. I will start acting right. I will try to talk right. I will look right. I will say the right things. I will try out here to become the person that I want to be in here, and hopefully it'll just kind of like happen. Does that work? No. The gospel inverts it and says, don't even bother trying to start out here and work your way in. Let God change you from the inside out. This is the beauty of the gospel. Nobody in this room and nobody watching online is too sinful to be changed by God. I hear this a lot as a pastor. I had it in conversation like two weeks ago. I was sitting with somebody and they said, I'm too bad, I don't deserve God, he can't love me. You ever felt that? You ever thought that? When people say that to me, I say, you know what? You're actually half right. The first half, you are bad and you don't deserve God. None of us do. That's the right half. The second half of that sentence is wrong. He can't love you. No, 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 no. Don't tie God's love to you because of where you failed in your past. That's not the gospel. What's the key? The key is Christ. I'm gonna give you three New Testament verses and I wish I could spend 45 minutes on each of them because they're so powerful and they're so important to me. Here's the first one. Romans 8 verse one. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? No condemnation. That's if you are hidden in Christ, your sin is gone. There's some condemnation. No, none. No condemnation. He took it all. Second one. This is one of my favorites too. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. The old is gone. The new, or the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're new when you're in Christ. Last one, Galatians 2.20. This is Paul where he says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What's that mean? The moment you confess Christ, everything changes. Your past and your activity and what you do does not determine what God can do through you. You're new. Praise God that it's over. God doesn't want to manage your mistakes. He wants to change your life. Rahab is a signpost that shows us that your past apart from Christ and your future with Christ are as different as night and day. If you are hidden in Christ, you are not your sin. You are not your past. That's not what defines you. So the question we have to ask with this one is, have you ever said, Christ, I'm a sinner and I'm counting on you to save me completely? Not like, Jesus, you open the door and now I'm gonna try and be a good person. That's not the gospel. That's not how that works. Rahab puts all her chips on God and says, it's just you. Have you ever done that? And if you haven't, you're still lost in your sin. But the moment you trust Christ, everything changes. God's plan for your future is not limited to your past. Number three, right out of this story. God doesn't play favorites and neither should we. God doesn't play favorites and neither should we. We said this last week, but it bears repeating. That in Jewish culture, there were three things you didn't want to be. Ancient Jewish culture said, you don't want to be a Gentile, you don't want to be a slave, and you don't want to be a woman. And then here, in Judges chapter two, when God's people are at the cusp of new beginnings, they're about to move into this thing that God had promised forever. Who, who, with everybody in the world at his sovereign fingertips, who does he choose? A Gentile, a slave, a woman. What is that? <laughs> That's God saying, I'm sovereign and I'm going to choose who I want to choose. 
God evaluates worth so differently than we do. It would be easy to look at Rahab and go, nope, she's not part of that. But the beauty of the gospel is that we evaluate worth based on who someone is. God evaluates worth based on who they become. Everyone is an image bearer, no matter what. Everybody is a sinner, no matter what. Everyone is loved by God, no matter what. And so anyone can be restored, no matter what. God saves who he wants to save, as he wants to save, when he wants to save, how he wants to save. He sets us up for his purposes, his plan, his timing, his glory. Now let me get practical on this for us. Here at North Canton Chapel, we say this all the time. We say we want to be the church who makes much of Jesus, what? You are almost there. We want to be the church who makes much of Jesus every day to everyone. And then God goes, because what we say is, well, who show me? Show me my everyone. Every day, show me. And God goes, how about them? And we go, hmm. (laughs) No, not them. Maybe somebody a little more like me. Maybe somebody a little easier. (laughs) The people you think that never could come to Jesus are usually the people that he uses most. Fourth, God's heart always beats for revival. I don't think the spies or Joshua or anybody expected Rahab. And that's why her story is so powerful. That's why I love her so much. From a worldly perspective, she looks like a total accident. But from God's sovereign perspective, Rahab is a sovereignly adopted daughter brought home. This is what revival looks like. He's like, God, forget what I want. Give me what you want. At the risk of being a little off-putting, something I've noticed, and I see it in myself, sometimes Christians don't want revival, we just want to remember. We're more interested in what was than what God can do. And I get it, like nostalgia is really nice, (laughs) I'm 42, I'm gonna be 43 next month and that means that I'm old enough to remember when things were different. And sometimes people walk into my office and they catch me leaning back in my chair, looking out my window, wistfully staring off into nostalgia, remembering when things were different. And here's the thing, the moment I do that, I disengage from the world that God has called me to impact. Nostalgia is nice. Remembrance is nice. It's great. But if you are alive here now, God has called you here now for a reason. God has called you to this world because he has something for you to do in this world. And I don't know about you, but I want my eyes open to see it. God hasn't called me to back then. He's called me to right now. And so if you're here right now, he has a plan for you right now. The opposite of revival is not tradition. Okay? The opposite of revival isn't like old stodgy stuff. No, no, no. The opposite of revival is self. Give me what I want. Revival says, God, just give me what you want. I don't care what it is. The crazy thing about that is when you do that, people start coming to Jesus who you'd never expect. And he works completely outside whatever boxes we've created in our own head. And it's absolutely beautiful. And if you've ever had a touch of that, you'd never want anything else. Don't you want to be a part of something that you never saw coming? I do. Practically, there are Rahabs at your office. Students, there are Rahabs at your school. And they've got little scraps of the God story, scraps too small to satisfy. And it may not seem like it, but they are wanting more. They are dead but dreaming, lost and looking, waiting on the other side of walls that most of us are scared out of our minds to cross. God's heart always beats for revival. So band, you guys can come on back out and we're gonna move to communion here in just a little bit. But as we do, I wanna give you one final detail. And this is kind of the cherry on top of the whole thing, so stay with me. Rahab shows up in another place in the New Testament. And like Rahab herself, it's a place that you probably didn't expect. Rahab is preserved. Jericho falls. She marries a guy named Salmon. How about that for a name? Matthew writes about him. I'm going to read this. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David the king. 
So put that together. Rahab, little old Rahab, King David's great-great-grandmother. Now, if you know how Matthew works, you follow David's family tree a little bit further, Rahab shows up in the line of another king, the king of kings. <laughs> Someone else who will welcome people who don't have a place to fit, people who are not expected, people who could have held on to their past but choose to release that past and say, okay, Lord, fix me, make me new. Do you know this king? 